We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. Pastor Mike and Amy Carrera are coming this morning. They're going to share their story with you. But uh, we are glad to welcome them to our staff here at Christian Heritage Church. Would you show them a Christian Heritage greeting this morning? Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Well, we are super excited. This day has come with uh, great anticipation, but I'll let you know why at the end. Oh, oh it's horrible. Well, good morning. Uh, we are, we've never hurried back from a vacation before. Normally you want to enjoy your vacation, but we just couldn't wait to get back to you guys. So we love you. We're excited. We've been eagerly praying and anticipating what God's going to do in Christian Heritage Church for 2019 and just so honored to serve the church and serve Pastor Steve and Pastor Yvonne. Uh, We're not going to so much as preach this morning as we are going to just share our stories and our hope is that by sharing our story um, that that inspires hope. That God's faithful, and he's mighty, and he's able to save. Amen. Amen. But I'm not going to make any promises, honey. Oh, (laughs) that's right. She won't make any promises. If it's God, don't stop me. Okay, Okay. I won't. For as as many times as we've done this now, it's, it's actually really difficult. See, Amy and I are completely opposite. Completely opposite. The way we communicate... The way we prepare, she doesn't. Um, in in everything, we're just we're opposites. So, mm-hmm. uh-huh. it's okay. Okay. If you can ever do a series together, or if you can preach together or speak together, then you are well equipped to do premarital counseling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, let's get moving here. <laughs> so. Um, It's interesting because years ago when I was giving my testimony, um, the Lord had kind of brought something to my mind, and it was, I started making poor decisions at a really young age, really young. In as early as fourth grade, I would be in class, and I would purposely not hand in homework. The teacher would, uh, when you didn't write, when you didn't hand in your homework, the teacher would write your name on the board, and then he would begin to write the assignments that you did not hand in. Now, I would let them build up, and then it got to a certain point, he would make you stay inside for recess, and none of that really mattered. I just waited to see how far it could build up before he'd get a hold of my parents. And then I'd just do it all handed in. Before that would happen, it was kind of a weird game for me. But it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I realized, wow, at, at such a young age, I was just making really, really poor decisions. Um, not raised in church at all. Um, we went to church. I didn't start going to church until uh, after I got saved. So... I had no church background or um, anything like that. And my childhood was the exact opposite. Uh, I grew up a PK. My father worked for Teen Challenge. He was actually saved. We call him the Teen Challenge old school crowd. Uh, He got saved under David Wilkerson's preaching and went through Teen Challenge and then continued to spend the rest of his life uh, serving Teen Challenge. And so we moved all over the place uh, doing ministry. I was in church probably four or five times a week. Uh, I'm pretty sure that every one of my Barbies spoke in tongues. And uh, that was just normalcy. You know, I, I remember thinking that it wasn't church if it was less than three hours and at least 30 people hadn't fallen out. And that was normal. That was my uh, upbringing. Yet even in the midst of an atmosphere like that, 
I chose to not have an intimate relationship with the Lord. I really viewed him as a to-do list or um, rules and regulations. And if you checked off the check boxes, then you were going to heaven. And if you didn't, then you weren't. And so that was really my view of God growing up. And my parents did the best that they could in ministry. Teen Challenge, as we know, is a very difficult ministry. It's like having a church, but the congregation never goes home. They live there. And so my parents did, you know, the best that they could, but it was hard uh, to raise a family and be committed your whole life uh, to a ministry. So um, childhood was the complete opposite, always in church uh, and just always wanting and seeking uh, my parents' time and attention, which pretty quickly grew to how do you get your parents' attention? Unfortunately, kids oftentimes go a, a negative route in order to do that. So um, getting into my teenage years, I was, uh, I was into sports. I played basketball, baseball, and football. And so those kept me for quite a while. But my poor decisions uh, kept uh, coming with me there. I would do um, just dumb things, vandalize. Uh, all through school, I was always the kid who really never turned in any homework, but would get a good grade on the test and just barely pass the class. Um, and that, that went through uh, all of my school years. Um, at 14 years old is when things kind of started to really uh, go downhill. Uh, my parents had gotten divorced. And I used that as an excuse at the time to really lash out. So my parents divorced. Of course, they're living in separate houses. I'm going back and forth. I'm playing one off the other. They're, you know, they're not communicating well because whatever was going on in their lives at the time. You know? And um, that's when I started to get into drugs. Now, sports kept me uh, till I was about 18 for the most part. You know, like a lot of uh, people, it starts out uh, on the weekends and kind of uh, graduates from there. And then by the time I was 18, I uh, left school early, got my GED, and uh, left school. And then basically 18 until 28 was just a complete mess. I did whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, to whomever I wanted, however I wanted. And it didn't matter. I had no regard for anybody else or for myself. Um, rules without a relationship always equals rebellion. It always does. It's biblical. So rules without a relationship for Amy meant rebellion. And then you add on top of it hitting teenage years. And I was just a hot mess. And uh, I was seeking acceptance. We had moved 10 times by the time I was 10 years old. So I became really good at finding, you could always find the bad kids, you know? Every time you moved, you didn't have to look too far to find out who the bad crowd was. And so I just began doing really stupid stuff and uh, quickly trying to fit in and being rebellious led to partying and drugs and alcohol and all of that uh, by the time I was in high school. Uh, in the 11th grade, I got kicked out of high school and I know I've shared this with different people and they're like, I can't picture you for one day <laughs> doing drugs or drinking or getting kicked out of high school. And that's because you now see Christ in me. And apart from him, I mean, we were just train wrecks. And uh, somewhere in the midst of my mess, I remember I was 16 years old and I just remember having this split second of feeling guilty about the way that I was living. And so I went to a church and I kind of slipped in the back and I thought, okay, this is good. That'll, this'll help me clear my conscience. And so I'm sitting in the back and within 15 minutes, the pastor and his wife ask all young people to come up to the front because they wanted to pray for them. 
And I remember looking around for the closest exit door because I thought there is no way I'm going up to the front. I was raised in church and I know what happens up there. And so I tried to make a kind of like a half turn towards the door and I like locked eyes with the pastor and they kind of looked at me. And so I knew I had to go up to the front and I was just, I was a mess. I was, you know, running from God. I, I would even go as far to say I was really like sticking it to him. Like, I, I don't want you. I don't want whatever it is you have. I don't, I don't want it. And so when I went up there, they started praying for everyone. And then they got to me and they started prophesying over my life. And I remember thinking, man, they have no idea what a train wreck I am. And if they did, they wouldn't be saying that stuff because I had no idea that it has nothing to do with what you currently see and everything to do with what he's created us to be. And so they began to prophesy and his wife said, I see you in the midst of women with veils over their face. And she said, you're a great warrior. And she said, you're going to you're going to hold up a sword that's going to pierce the darkness. And she had no idea that at the age of 28, we would go into an all-Muslim community and serve for two years. And so even in my mess, I mean, I didn't come out of that for a long time. God still was pursuing. And you can see it and you can hear it throughout our story that even in the darkest time and even in the worst of time, that I felt like he didn't love us and he couldn't possibly love us. He was always seeking and always knocking and always going after us. Um, At about 18, I think that's really where things for me started to, to go downhill quickly. I was partying and living a bad lifestyle, but at the age of 18, um, heroin became, uh, my focus, as well as Mike's focus. I was older than 18, though, at the time. (laughs) I'm a little bit older than her. Just a little. And uh, that was, you know, quickly things just spiraled out of control. And um, in every way, shape, and form, whatever TV show you've seen, whatever movie you've seen, that was us. Um, We were heroin junkies together and just living that lifestyle. Um, During this time, my parents, right, being raised in church and, you know, them having a close relationship with the Lord did what they knew best, and that was to pray and to fast and then to do it over again. And then they would lose hope at times, and then they would do it all over again. Um, And, you know, just to give you like a glimpse of what it's like for the parent And then for a child who is wrapped up in addiction, my mom would find drugs. She would find my drugs. And I remember one time telling her, Mom, I have no idea why people are planting drugs in your car. I mean, we should find them. And she would just, she would just cry. I mean, she would just break down and she would just cry and beg me, Amy, you're going to die this way. You know, you have to stop. This isn't your destiny. And she would cry and plead with me. And I remember looking at her and I just said one time, Mom, I actually want to die most days that I wake up. Um, Addiction had gotten so bad that I felt like it was hell. Like Like I was living in hell. And possibly whatever the afterlife was going to be had to be better than what my life was every day. Um, And in the midst of that, I had met Mike, and uh, he was interested in wrecking his life equally as fast and as hard, so we became two forces that joined together to do this. Yeah, and up until this point, of course, I had not met the Lord, so um, I had no relationship. I didn't know who he was. I think I might have went to church a couple of times when I was 14 for the girls, but outside of that, I had no idea who God was. So um, while at times I was feeling horrible because of 
the life I was living, it, I can look back and I see now that that's, that's God being faithful and nudging and, hey, listen, I'm here, I'm here. But I, mm-hmm. I just I didn't know that at the time. I, had, I, just, I just didn't know. So 28 years old, uh, full-blown addiction. Um, my mom, Amy's dad, said, you're done. Enough's enough. Uh, I had burned every bridge possible. It's February in Michigan, so it's cold. There's snow on the ground, and I had nowhere to go. No more couches to sleep on. Uh, my, my car got repossessed. Um, there, there was nothing for me to do. So Amy's dad says, you're going to Team Challenge. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. February in Michigan. Nowhere to go. Okay. I'll go to Teen Challenge. So I had this plan. They sent me off to Teen Challenge in Long Island, New York. So they got me a good amount of miles away from home. And uh, I get out there. And I'm, I'm like, all right. I'm going to get some clean time in. I'm going to get some clean time in. I'm going to get out of here. Then I'm just going to smoke pot and drink. Not going to do anything else. It'll be fine. Just those things. So that was my plan to start. A couple months into the program, it's a year-long program. So two months into the program, I thought, all right, maybe I'll give God a try. As if, right? Maybe I'll give him a try. I started listening to the pastor. I'm paying attention in class. I'm reading my Bible. But nothing is making sense. You know, nothing's clicking. I'm not really understanding what I'm reading. I'm paying attention and I'm trying and I'm just getting really frustrated. So after a few weeks of this, all right, back to plan A. Never mind with plan B. Back to plan A. I'll get this clean time in. I'll get out. It'll be fine. We'll live a good life. Well, but God, (laughs) you know. But God. Amen. Yeah, but God. Every time, that's my favorite saying. Anytime you come across that in the Bible, Uh I love it. Because it's, but God. And then something gigantic happens, right? But God. He said, no, I have a different plan for you, son. And so I had a dream. And in my dream, I am lamenting. Um, to this lady. She's in all white. She kind of looks like the good elf witch from Lord of the Rings, but, and I don't know why. It's just what she looked like. And I'm telling her, I'm lamenting. I don't understand anything. None of this is making sense. The Bible doesn't make sense to me. You know, at this time, people are telling me, they were telling me to read the Gospels. So I'm reading the Gospels. Nothing's really clicking. And I'm done with this. And she's just standing there listening. She never said a word. And I turned around and got a drink of water uh, out of the cooler. My dream took place in the program I was in. And so uh, I turned back around and she's gone. And then I walk out of um, the mess hall, out into the courtyard. And there's like a bunch of fighting going on. All the students and the staff, not like like all out brawling, but they're just kind of in each other's faces, you know, kind of pushing and yelling and, and poking. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I got to get out of here. This is crazy. And so I go back into uh, my dorm room and there's a note on my bed. And I opened it up and it said, read Isaiah 41. And I woke up and at this point in time, I had um, never been to the Old Testament because people were telling me to read the Gospels. So I wake up, I open to Isaiah 41, and now Isaiah 41 for me as a whole, the, whole, the, the chapter as a whole, I'm still, I'm still going through, and, and the whole chapter is for me, I believe. But in the time, I started reading, and I got down to verse 8, and verse 8 through 10 says, 
But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And in that moment, I, it, it was supernatural. Because in that moment, I knew that I knew that I knew that I, I was saved. And I knew him. And now later on, I made sure to say the sinner's prayer just in case. But I know in that moment, however it happened, my, my heart said yes. And the scales fell off. And from that point on, things just got really good. <laughs> um, I started uh, understanding what I was reading, you know. Um, I started to gain favor in the program. I had only been in the program for a couple of months at this time, and it was a, it was a rather large program, uh, 60 to 80 men. And um, I was over the kitchen, and I had a chauffeur's license. So I would drive the bus, and uh, we fun, did a lot of fundraising, and I found a lot of f- uh, favor in that. And um, uh, things just went from there. So with Mike gone to Long Island Teen Challenge, uh, I, my parents said that they had found a place for me, and I thought that maybe it was some sort of program, and they said, uh, nope, what you need is to go far away, away from everyone and everything, and there is a small house in the hills of Pennsylvania in the middle of nowhere, a friend of a friend of a friend, there's an attic and an air mattress waiting for you. <laughs> Literally. Literally. An attic, so yeah. I, I got to visit her once when I was in Teen Challenge. <laughs> it, it was really an attic and it was an air mattress. And I'm so still so grateful for that attic and for that air mattress because that's where God met me. And I remember getting there and thinking, this is probably the worst time in my entire life. Um, I didn't go through a detox. I was all of the horrible things you've heard in that attic on that air mattress. She is a much stronger person than I am. (laughs) I I got to go through a medical detox um, for five days or so, and then went to Teen Challenge. She did not get that privilege. And it was okay. God <laughs> God showed me through it all his faithfulness. But I remember thinking that I was going to die, you know, shaking and going into convulsions and all sorts of things. And I was dead set on not asking him for help. And... um It wasn't that I was some strong-willed child. The root of it was I thought that if he really could see and know everything that I had done, if what they said about him was true, then he knew what a wretched person I was. And there's no way that he would want to help me or that he could or would love me. And so I held on to this, I'm not giving in. I'm not asking him for help until it got so bad. And sometimes, you know, parents praying that it gets so bad that your child gets to the end of their rope is an okay prayer and it's an okay place for them to be. So I prayed and I said, God, if you're real and if everything I've heard about you my whole life is really true, then I need you right now. And if you, do you like all the ifs in my prayer? I mean, (laughs) I think back to what God must have thought in that moment. I was like, if you're real, 
if what I heard was true, and if you can even save me, then I will turn, I'll serve you, and I will never look back, and I'll never go back to my old life. And from that moment forward, everything became new. And he took me up on that offer, and I went a few days later for a walk, and you know, for seven years I had been just a walking zombie, just not even a... There wasn't a day that you could catch me where my eyes were open and I was even semi-coherent. And so I go on this walk, and I remember hearing leaves fall from the tree. It was in the fall, and it was as if I had smelt fall for the first time. It was as if I had heard the leaves falling for the first time, and I realized he was reawakening all of my senses everything and he was coming and literally from the inside out was making everything new now how many of you know your relationship with the lord is a process right it does not happen overnight (laughs) it doesn't we want it to (laughs) we want everything now but uh the Lord has to refine us. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's, it's a process. And um, after that experience at Teen Challenge, everything was great and we never had any problems again. The end. Yeah. <laughs> God came and it was good. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what happened. So after Teen Challenge, um, we, stayed, we both stayed clean. Uh, no drugs, no alcohol, nothing like that. Um, but we did spend, or at least I did, um, Amy to a lesser degree, spent a couple of years after Teen Challenge just kind of meandering around. I wasn't uh, really serving the Lord. I was, like I said, staying clean, but wasn't really serving the Lord, wasn't um, making uh, church much of a priority, just working a lot and really doing a lot of nothing. Um, after about, I don't know, a year, I guess, a year and a half of that, uh, Amy and I decided to get back together. After Teen Challenge, after I had gotten out of Teen Challenge, we spent some time apart from each other. Um, her by herself with her parents, and I lived with my sister. And so Amy and I decided to get back together before we were married. Mm-hmm. That was a mistake. Mm-hmm. Can I tell you? That was a mistake. We decided to move back in together and get back together before we were married. Well, it didn't take us very long to realize that that was a huge mistake. And by this time, we were living in Detroit and Gianna's with us and it's just the three of us. And we're like... We knew what we were doing was wrong. But no one told us, and this is, you know, this is really interesting. No one said, you guys shouldn't be living together like you are. You know, God doesn't bless that. Or No one was telling us that. There was a genuine, if you allow the Holy Spirit to live in you and convict you, he will. And that's what happened to us. I mean, it really was. It was like one day, I remember getting out of the shower, getting out of the bathroom, and I had a towel on, and I was like, ugh. Yeah. She's and I slammed the door shut, and I went to go get dressed. And it was like all of a sudden, just one day, the Holy Spirit in us convicted us for what we were doing, living like we were married and a family, yet we were not. So uh, the conviction sets in, and we spent the next year, her and Gianna living in one room of the apartment, and me living in the other room of the apartment, completely celibate. We got plugged in to a good church, and the pastor helped us along through that process. 
we, we spent a year like that, and then he married us. And then we didn't have to spend any more time like that. <laughs> I, I, like, I joke around and I say if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit and Amy's willpower, uh, I probably would have failed multiple times in that year. But <laughs> um, Getting plugged in at uh, Clinton Valley Assemblies of God in Detroit was definitely God's design. Um, that's yeah. where we, I mean, we got filled with his spirit. We got water baptized. We got married. Noah was dedicated there. And all of this happened in an expedited time. I mean, 15 years ago, 14 years ago, we were junkies together. And so, I mean, that wasn't that long ago, 14 years. So this was really a a fast, God kind of, once we surrendered our lives to him, he took us up on an expedited offer. It was once, once we fully surrendered that I and I remember this specifically that, that moment where that conviction set in and we, this is wrong. What we're doing is wrong. And we made the decision to do it the right way. It boom, Mm -hmm. it just, it started happening, you know, and he blessed that. When you do it God's way, he will bless it, you know? Yeah, you can go around the mountain for 40 years if you want to. Uh, And we were doing that. It was just the same circle, 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 and then all of a sudden. So we're in Clinton Valley for two years, and Pastor Randy Marin, who's still a great, great friend of ours to this day, just really um, took us under his wing and uh, walked us through a lot of stuff for those couple of years. And in that time, like Amy said, you know, we both got baptized in the spirit, baptized in water. Uh, Gianna got baptized there. Uh, Noah got dedicated there. Um, We got married there. I started taking global university classes, which is the Assemblies of God's um, credentialing school. Uh, So I went through those and we served um, at Clinton Valley in every way you can imagine as uh, young adult uh, pastors and worship and youth and children and outreach, <laughs> everything you could possibly do. Yeah, we were so excited that God had saved us. We were like, can we scrub the toilets? Because it would just bless us. I mean, it was um, such an awesome time to go from just complete bondage to freedom. We were just so grateful. And we were like, yeah, we'll do anything. Yeah, children's ministry, youth ministry, just all of it. Um, Soon after Clinton Valley, we... uh, felt called to go to the mission field. And uh, Mike is such an amazing, better person than I am. We called our pastor to tell him what we (laughs) felt like the Lord was saying. And I, so he's sitting there and he's looking at us and he's like, so what's God telling you guys? And I was like, oh, that, you know, it's going to be a good year. (laughs) And, um, you know, that's really it. That's it. I just. I think you even were like, I gotta go do something, like go change the laundry the or get out of the bathroom or something. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, Amy, no. <laughs> I just couldn't. I saw his face and how much he had poured into us, and I didn't want to disappoint him or leave mm-hmm. him. So anyway, Mike tells him, we feel like God has called us to go to Dearborn, which is the highest concentrated population of Muslim Arabs in the entire world outside of the Middle East. So even a higher concentration than parts of Europe. And, um, and you know, like a, like a great, great leader does... He, he prayed into that with us. He didn't, oh, that's not God, that's not God, you must not be hearing this right. He listened to what we had to say, and he prayed with us about it, and then we came back together, and, and, and he blessed it. Mm-hmm. So we moved to Dearborn, and uh, our second night there, 
a water pipe on the second floor bursts and floods the house. And I remember looking at Mike and I said, someone doesn't want us here. And mind you, this is a 98% Arab Muslim community. So we are like one of five like American families that lives in this area. And um, over the next two years, we just had... It was the worst spiritual warfare we had ever faced, and yet the brightest dawn that would shine in the midst of it. It's, un, it's unexplainable. I really, it's hard to even put into words. Um, and I just, you know, for those two years, I prayed fervently for that community, and we labored, and we really uh, didn't see a lot of fruit. Um, a few, and a few really amazing testimonies for another time, but um, there was one one time and one moment that made all of two years worth it. Uh, there was one young man who converted uh, from Islam to Christianity, and most don't do that because they will be completely cut off from their entire community. And uh, he came to us, it was really late, I think it was maybe like one or two o'clock in the morning, and he was shaking, and he had his Bible that's half in Arabic and half in English, because he didn't speak English or read or write very well, and he said, oh, and he would always say sister, so, you know, he said, Sister Amy, and he's shaking, and he's going through, and he said he had read through the whole Bible, And he highlighted every part that said that he was a son and that he was loved. And I thought, you know, if two years, if that was the only fruit that came from it, then that was worth it. Then that was worth it. For one son to come to glory, then it's worth it. Yeah. So after our two years in Dearborn, um, we got to Tallahassee, except for... It's it is it's crazy kind of the way it all went down when uh, God seems to move quickly in our lives when he wants to do something mm-hmm. um, of any sort of significance, I feel like. So we had this plan to buy a 3,500 square foot house in the middle of East Dearborn. And we're working with the Assemblies of God towards becoming uh, home missionaries and we were going to open up a mission space. It was going to be a place to train the missionaries going over to the 1040 window. And then, of course, any home missionaries, because outside of Dearborn, there are um, large parts of, in Texas and um, Minnesota of concentrated populations of Arab Muslims. Um, so th- that's, that's what we were going to do. We were going to get this house. We are going to become a mission space and so we're living in the house and um at first things are things seem to be going well and then they just were not the house needed a lot of work um there wasn't a lot of money coming in we were going to end up having to put a lot more um, of our own money into it than what we were able to raise which we were okay with doing Um, And then when it got down to the wire there with having to close on the house, it just fell apart. It fell apart like every door slammed shut in a matter of four weeks and we had no jobs, had to move. Friends of ours were like, oh, that's so bad, it has to be God. And I was like, your theology's really jacked up because what does that even mean right now? Our life is in shambles. Yeah. Like, we're going to buy, we decided maybe God wants us further down the road, so we started looking at this other house that was right on the Detroit Dearborn border before we could uh, close on that the house gets broken into and they ripped everything out of the walls all the copper all the metal the hot water heater I mean ripped it out of the walls so doors slammed so shut they didn't just slamming close. shut and that's when I get a call from Amy's dad and he says Tallahassee Teen Challenge has been without a program manager for I think at that, this time it was like six months or so. 
I think you should apply. <laughs> we laughed. I, I laughed like laughing. Sarah laughed. You know, because it, we had visited, um, we had come down here to visit uh, Mike and Carla out the church for a spring break, and I thought to myself, no way. I'm not going to, to Tallahassee. Someone should take a picture. <laughs> we this we is love Detroit. To Christ. We love we love Metro Detroit. We love the ethnicity and the diversity and the hustle and the bustle of the city. Um, we just we love it. And so when he said that, I just was cracking up laughing. I was like, he must be joking. And within just a few weeks, our entire house, (laughs) everything, we gave everything away and we moved here. And it was literally within a matter of weeks. God said, no, that's not, you are going to Tallahassee and you will work at Teen Challenge. Mm -hmm. And I came kicking and screaming the whole way. I wish I could tell you that every time after I got saved, it was like, yes, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do it. That's sometimes. But then there were, this was one of those times where I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not leaving these people. I'm not, I'm not going to. The transition was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard um, in a lot of different ways to leave the Detroit area and come here. Um, probably a little harder for you. Um, it, it, the first probably year and a half, really, to almost two years was really difficult to be here. Um, Leaving the mission field is not something that anyone had prepared us for. Um, and I had never read a book about it. And I didn't know that the, the guilt that I felt, I just... I, I became really, when we first moved here, severely depressed because I, I had this guilt. Like, I made it out, but they didn't. And they were there. And then it was just the enemy because then here comes God like, Amy, if I picked you up and I placed you in Dearborn to tell them and to be a light, how much more can I pick up someone else and put them there? You know, who was I to think that, like, it all, their salvation fell on our shoulders. So it was a rough transition. However, God used some amazing people. And um, I really have like grown over time to love Tallahassee <laughs> and to love the people here. So yes, I'm no longer kicking or screaming. <laughs> so that brings us to today. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because um, I had... I've done a lot of different things for Teen Challenge over the past four or so years. And uh, one of the first things, one of the first jobs I had, actually, I got brought down to be the program manager. And then within like three or four months, we had a thrift store on Tennessee Street. And um, the manager left. And they asked me to manage that thrift store. Uh, They thought that would be a good idea. but uh, So I did. And one of the first jobs I had was to get these donation boxes they had, uh, we had um, out into different areas, these big blue boxes where people would drop uh, things off at, uh, items, you know, to be sold at the store. And so I was tasked with meeting up with different people and trying to get these boxes out there. And so one of the first things I did is I uh, started calling uh, pastors and I called Pastor Steve, and um, he met with me for lunch, and, and, uh, or I think it was coffee. He was at Lucky Go, right? And um, we had a, had a great conversation, just talked about a lot of different things. You know, he's, he's not from Tallahassee. I'm not from Tallahassee. We both have a deep love for it now. But um, after my meeting with him, um, I left the meeting, and the Lord told me that I would be serving at Christian Heritage within five years. And I've ne- I never told anybody that except for my wife. Um, because, well, I just, you know, that would, that would have been kind of boastful to me. I've always, I've just, I've always loved Christian Heritage. I, you guys have heard me talk before about how I feel about this church and and the dynamic it has in the panhandle with the diversity and the ethnicity. I just, I love it. It reminds me of home. Mm -hmm. And so when the Lord told me that, I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So I'm not going to tell people that. 
other than her. And then this past August, I think it was, at the missions banquet, um, it came out <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> I wasn't even it around. It was an accident. <laughs> and Pastor Steve looked like he knew. <laughs> so I thought I would tell him what he already knew, but he didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Amy, Amy spills the beans on me. I've, I've not said anything to anybody except for her at this point. And, um, you know, that brings us to today. And so that's why when I started, I said I've had great mm-hmm. anticipation for this day. Uh, for four years now. Um, I'm not a very emotional person. If you could see, though, what's going on, the, on, on the inside right now, mm-hmm. yeah, you'd be crying. <laughs> um, if the worship team would like to come back up, I know we're over, and you have been so gracious uh, in listening to our story, but we want you to know uh, more than just knowing us, Knowing what God has done. I mean, you heard, like apart from God, you heard it with your own ears. We were a train wreck. We were on a fast track to how quick can we destroy everyone and everything in our way. And then God comes in and he is the reason why all of that happened. It had nothing to do with us. We just simply were sick and tired of living a a sinful life that was headed nowhere. And so the only good thing that we did was finally say, okay, I can't do this. And, And I surrender to your will and to your ways. And that was the only good decision that we really made. And then he started uh, just taking us up on those offers. Um, what our hope and our prayer always testimony is that you would know a few things. And one is um, in Matthew 18, I know we're all familiar with this passage where God gives the parable of the lost sheep. Our story is proof that what he said in his word is true. And it says that as a good shepherd, he will leave his flock, he'll leave the 99 to pursue the one that goes off. And we were those ones. We left and we strayed and he pursued us and pursued us and pursued us. And that is the gospel. While we were far from him, while we were sinners, dead in our sin, he called us out to be reconciled to him. And so we hope that you see that in us and in our story, which is really his story and meant completely for his glory And it's a lie that the enemy would tell you that you're too far from him. It's a lie that the things that you've done have pushed God away and that sin has caused this huge separation. See, that's what the cross was for. That separation doesn't exist anymore all you have to do is take not even a full turn just a a flinch towards his direction and his blood has covered all of the wrongs all of the sin all of the shame he wiped heroin addiction away like it never even existed and you don't smell that on me and you don't see that on me because his blood has the power to cleanse you and so we want to just open the altar today because here's the thing it did take something on our part we did have to make that decision to say you know what i'm ready i'm ready to surrender my life i'm ready to say yes god i accept you i accept your son's sacrifice and i want the life 
that you have for me. And so if you would, let's just bow our heads and give God this moment. Father, thank you that you are just, you are such a good father. And no matter what we've done, no matter our past, you have always been pursuing us. You've never stopped. You've never left us. You've never forsaken us. And your desire right now is for your sons and daughters to be welcomed into your kingdom, welcomed into your arms. So I ask that you would knock on those hearts once again. And any man, woman, child that desires to live the life that you have for them, that you would draw them, that you would draw them to come. You would draw them to come. We're going to open the altars. And if you would like to come and just surrender, that's all we did. It wasn't elaborate prayer. It was really simple. It was, God, I literally have nothing but a hot mess to offer. And I give it to you. Father, thank you that you're so faithful to meet us in this place. Would you come? Would you come and would you meet us? Don't worry about who is around you. If you would like to come and pray, we invite you to take that step because we know that there is a good, faithful, amazing Father who is longing to just meet you today and to meet you in this place. So, Uh, Let's open the altars, but I also want to just say if there are any parents here that you are struggling with a a child or maybe your aunt or uncle and they are uh, in addiction, I can tell you that it was the prayers of loved ones that made a way that brought us to the end of our rope and we would be honored to pray with you and to believe for that prodigal to come back home. We're going to, um, we're also going to pray for dismissal right now, but we're going to linger around here and leave the altars open. Should you guys want to come down and pray? We'll be here to pray with you. So father, we just love you, Lord. We thank you for who you are and what you do. We pray that, uh, 2019 would be the year of yes. The year that we say yes, yes to all that you have. Father, we just love you so much and we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. We love you, we love you, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.